Well, good morning once again. And even though I'm not here in person, let me just say welcome to church one more time. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for technology. Uh, can I just get a big amen in the house for technology? Yeah, I'm so thankful that even though this morning I'm not able to be there in person, that I'm still able to be there digitally. And I'm just telling you, even though I'm not in person, I am so stirred today and confident that God has a word for you and that God, through the power of his spirit, wants to speak to you today and, and really do something significant in your life. Uh, if you got a Bible today, go with me to Matthew chapter 28. Uh, we're going to read verses 19 through 20, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. And we are starting today a brand new series across all of our campuses that we are calling More Than Believers. Uh, the tagline of this series is the making of a disciple. Uh, but we're starting the series More Than Believers. And here's what our hope is, and really it's our prayer. It's our hope and it's our prayer that this series really would become for our church a shifter and a setter for our culture. That the culture of our church, who we are, uh, who we are, are striving and endeavoring to be the heart, the passion, the DNA of our church community, our culture, that this series, it would shift it in any ways that it needs to be shifted. And like something just being set in cement, it would set our culture, that of a church, a community, a people whose passion and priority is to be more than just believers in Jesus, but to be disciples of Jesus. We're starting this series today, More Than Believers, and we are going to, for the next number of weeks, talk about what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? How do we become disciples of Jesus? And maybe even more importantly, the reality that the call of God on our life, Jesus' call and Jesus' invitation to every single one of us, it is to be more than just believers, more than just people who attend church on Sunday, more than people who just have knowledge of God, believe in God, but rather to be more than believers, to be disciples, to be people who are passionately following after Jesus as our Lord, as our master. And so I ask you today to open up with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 28. I wanna read you two verses today. Uh, I promise you, it will not be the only two verses that we read, but two verses that will set the stage for this series. Uh, I'm reading today out of the New King James Version. If you don't have that version, not a big deal. All the words will be on the screen, uh, but, but reading along with me, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, uh, those who were following him in the gospels. And here's what he says. He says, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. If you're taking notes today, you can write down the title of the sermon, the very first sermon in this collection. Uh, we're titling it this, The Goal is Discipleship. Uh, if, if you like to write less words like I do sometimes, uh, you could simply put the title for this morning, The Goal. What, what is the goal? Well, the goal is discipleship. I don't, I don't know if you, this has ever happened to you before, but have you ever realized that you've completely missed the point of something. Uh, you had, you know, tracking it all the way back to when you were in high school or middle school or college. Maybe you had an assignment that was due, a project you were supposed to be working on. Uh, maybe it was like a work project, something that your boss assigned you, uh, something a client wanted done. Uh, maybe it was a party or it was a function. It was a social gathering. And you went through the motions. You did the work. You completed the task assignment project. You went to the party, whatever it may be. And on the backside, you realize, oh, I think I kind of missed the point. Like I kind of did it, 
but I think I missed the point of it. Uh, recently, I was at the gym that I work out at, uh, which I feel very embarrassed and weird saying because I feel like I don't look like I ever go to a gym. Uh, I promise you, muscles are coming, maybe, probably not. Uh, but I'm, I'm at the gym that I work out at, and I don't know if you're like this, and I don't mean, in, mean it in a creepy way. Please don't take it that way, but I'm a people watcher. I, I could sit in the mall and I could sip on an iced tea and watch people all day. I'm a people watcher. And, and in the gym, that's kind of like creepy. Like you don't want to watch people working out. That's kind of weird. Um, but, but I'm more of an observer because I, I am trying to get better. I want to be more knowledgeable. I want to know that I'm doing the right thing and am I doing it the right way. And so in particular, people that are very fit, very fit people, um, I, I, I observe what, what, what are they doing? What, how are they doing it? And there's a group of guys that I've met. I don't work out with them. I would not be able to work out with them, but I've met them and uh, had some conversation with them. And I know that some of them are doing some supplements, some things that are maybe not all the way natural or legal. Um, but, but I observe because they clearly know what they're doing. And so I'm at the gym and I'm watching these guys and they are just lifting enormous amounts of weight and they're, you know, doing their routine. And I'm watching them. Again, I know because I know them that they maybe do some supplements that are not all natural, if you know what I mean. And, and I'm watching them and, and, and they're kicking back their pre-workouts, uh, basically energy drinks on steroids, no pun intended. And they're, ki you know, ki kicking back the pre-workouts. And it, it just occurred to me, wait a minute. Could it be possible they're missing the point, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, isn't like working out and fitness, isn't that about like health? I don't think those drinks they're drinking are healthy. I'm pretty sure supplements they may or may not be taking are, are, are could it be possible they're missing the point because, ah, wait, wait a minute, isn't fitness not about aesthetics only? Isn't it just not about looking awesome and lifting heavy? Isn't it about your body being healthier? And then in my, you know, my mind's going, I'm thinking about, I don't know if you know this person, Ronnie Coleman. Uh, he's like, you know, the greatest uh, Mr. Olympia bodybuilder of all time, arguably, but I think the greatest. And, and he was great in his prime. But now that he's older, he, he can really barely function because his bones and his joints and his spine even is so uh, messed up because of, because of the, the amount of work he put on it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, could it be possible there's people in here missing the point because it's about aesthetics, it's about how you look, it's about, you know, trying to lift a certain number and, and their body's actually not getting healthier. Maybe in the process, their body's becoming less healthy. And I think that, that concept, that idea, that picture, it kind of applies to you and I because could it be possible for many people, we've missed the point, that we've... We've mistaken the point or the call of God, the invitation of God as to just be people who believe in him, to just be people who, who acknowledge his reality, to just be people who, yeah, we come to church on Sunday morning. We're doing the best we can to have good morals and good values and raise our kids right, but, but we're, we're, we're mere believers in him. And I would say that for anyone who is simply a mere believer in Jesus, that to some degree you've missed the point, we've missed the point because the goal is not to believe in him. And remember the Bible says this, even the demons believe in him. Th think about this for a second. That even Lucifer, Satan, the enemy, the devil, that even him and his demons believe in Jesus. They know of his reality. They know of his existence. They believe in him with, with deep conviction because they know of his reality. And I don't know, sometimes I, I wonder, have, have we missed it in that in our modern day Christianity, we're settling for just believing. Yeah, I, I, I believe in Jesus. Oh, absolutely, pastor. I believe that he is real. But what I hope we'll discover in this series and maybe even today is that the invitation of Jesus is not to just believe in him. It is to be his disciple. 
Matthew 28, 19 through 20, we read it, but I, but I want to go back to it and point something out. Jesus talking to his disciples, and we will define that word in a minute, but Jesus talking to his followers, this is what he says. He says, Matthew 28, 19, he says, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. Come on, everyone in the room this morning, repeat after me, just say disciples. Yeah, go therefore and make disciples. He did not send his 12 guys out. He did not send those who, who followed him. He did not say, guys, here's the mission. I'm leaving, I gotta go, but here's the mission. Just go make converts. I, I kind of want to be like Santa Claus. I just want people to believe in me. I want people to believe in the Christian magic, like they believe in the Christmas magic. No, 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 no. He didn't say go make converts. He didn't say go make believers. Jesus said, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 20. And I want you to teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, remember, I'm with you always to the, to, even to the end of the age. What is Jesus saying? That his call, his invitation, it is to not just be a believer, but it is to be a disciple. And in fact, it is to be a disciple who in turn makes other disciples. He said, guys, you are my disciples. You've been following me for three years. You've been watching and listening and learning and practicing my ways. You are my disciples. And now I'm calling you to go make disciples. Not just people who believe in me, but people who follow me as disciples. And in the same way, the call of God on our life, it is to be disciples who make disciples. Brandon, we've said this word a lot today, disciple. Uh, can you please define that for me? The word disciple uh, in the Hebrew is the word Talmud. And in the word Greek, uh, or in, in the, the Greek, it is the word Matthias. Both of which translate to, to this to be either a student or an apprentice. A student or an apprentice. Uh, I, I think it's better that we go with the word apprentice. And here's why. Because the word student might just imply someone who's gathering knowledge. The word student might just imply someone who is a learner. And I'm not saying that's all students do, and I don't want to argue over s s semantics, but, but, but the word student for many people, it's just, it's a learner. Yeah, it's someone who, and we're going to hit the textbook hard. We're going to hit the Bible hard, and we're going to learn lots of things about God. I'm going to read the Bible all the way through this year. I'm going to do a couple Bible studies. I'm going to get smarter about God. But, but, what, but the word apprentice, it has a different implication. Uh, and an apprentice of someone is someone who, who, who they're with them. An apprentice is someone who, who they have proximity to, to the master. And, and they have proximity so that they can watch and they can listen and they can learn. And they can, alongside their master, they can practice their ways so that they can become like them. What does it mean to be a disciple? To be a disciple, it is to be an apprentice of Jesus. One who, who is with Jesus. One who watches and listens and learns from Jesus. One who follows after Jesus and alongside of Jesus practices his ways. Discipleship is apprenticeship. Apprenticeship to Jesus. It's not just being a student who gets smarter and who learns more facts and information about God, but rather it is an apprentice of Jesus who is, listen to this, who is learning from Jesus in order to become like Jesus. It is one who is learning from Jesus in order to become like Jesus. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. First thought I want to give you today simply is this, that Jesus calls us to be his disciples. Jesus is not calling you to just be a believer in him. Jesus does not want just your, your belief, 
your acknowledgement of his reality, but rather what we read in the gospels and what we find all through the New Testament is that the call of Jesus is one to come and follow him, to be with him and to follow him, to learn from him so that we can become like him. Think about Matthew chapter four, verses 18 through 19. It's when Jesus calls his first disciples. I want to read it to you. It says this, and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And here's what he says. And he said to them, follow me. One scripture says that Jesus chose 12, that he might be with them and that he might send them out. What one scripture tells us that Jesus, he called his disciples to follow him for the purpose of being with them, allowing them to, to watch, listen, learn, practice, to, to be with him that he might send them out as they are like him. And he says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. What I would like to say again, just very plain and very simple today, is that Jesus is calling us to be more than believers. And I, I, don't, I don't know where, where you are today, where you are in your faith journey, how long you've been coming to church, how long you've been uh, in relationship with God, but wherever you are, can I, can I remind you? Can I stir you up? Can I even challenge you that what we read in the New Testament is not a call to belief only? It is not a call to acknowledgement of God's reality only, but rather it is a call to be a disciple, one who is a watcher, a learner, a listener, who is following Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. And here, here's what I think we just need to understand today is that being a disciple, it is a choice. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Second thought I wanna give you, it's that, that being a disciple, it is a choice choice. We just read this passage, but I want to read it to you again, and I want you to see something. Matthew 4, 18, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they are fishermen. And verse 19 says, then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets followed him. They made a choice, didn't they? I've heard this said before that the Bible, it is not a book of destiny, but rather it's a book of decision. The Bible is not just a book about destiny and calling and purpose, but rather it is really a book about decisions. It's a book about ordinary men and women just like you and I who did not have supernatural giftings and abilities and were not superstars and rock stars and characters that, that don't exist in real life. No, they're just regular, normal, down-to-earth men and women, frail and broken and, and, and flawed, just, just like us. But it's a book about men and women who, who yes, were called by God, but made decisions it's not just about these great men and women who had great destinies. No, all of us today have a destiny, a calling, a purpose, and a plan that God has put in our life. But the Bible is about men and women who made choices. They made decisions to follow God, to trust God to obey God. What we see in the gospels and throughout the New Testament, it is a story not only of Jesus, but about men and women who made the choice to follow him, who made the choice to, to run after him, who made the choice to be more than just a believer on the sidelines, but to be followers, disciples of his. And you know, as much as the New Testament is full of stories and examples of people who chose to follow him, it's also full of stories and examples of people who did not choose to follow him. I think about a character, you may or may not be familiar with them, but as a man that we refer to as the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, um, he, he had everything, and yet he was still empty on the inside searching. He was rich. He had affluence and influence. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what am I missing? 
And Jesus says, all right, well, um, just go like, you know, just, just like be, 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 be perfect. Just go follow. He's like, well, I'm, I, no, I'm doing all that. I'm following the law. I'm doing everything I know to do. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, so Jesus said to him, well, if you want to be perfect, better, better translation, if, if you really want to do what's right, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. Know that your treasure will be in heaven. And you, come follow me. It was an invitation to be his disciple. It was not an invitation to just be a part of his entourage. It was not an invitation to just come and be a part, part of the tour. No, it was an invitation to be his disciple. The rich young ruler, like many people today, he's searching, he's looking. I'm empty, I'm hollow. I have it all and yet I feel like I have nothing. What am I missing? And Jesus says, oh man, I know you have money, but more than money, you, you have money, money has you. I know you got treasure, but more than you have treasure, treasure has you. So here, here's what you gotta do. Go sell all you have and come be my disciple. And verse 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. See, the scripture is full of men and women just like you and I who made choices. Some who chose to follow Jesus. They heard the call of God. Come and follow me and be my disciple. And they chose, like those 12 young men, to leave their nets, to leave their families, to leave their businesses, to leave all they had and follow him. And then it's full of other people who who wanted, who needed the power of God and the life that Jesus only can offer. And yet when he invited them, come and follow me, they said, I, 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 I can't. I guess the question that I'm, I'm asking you this morning is what's your choice? What's your choice? Because Jesus is calling every single one of us to follow him. He's calling every single one of us to be more than believers, but to be those who are disciples of his, those who will be with him, who will listen to his voice, who will study the scripture and, and watch how he lived and how he moves, to be with him and listen and learn and watch and follow, all for the purpose of practicing the practices he practiced and becoming like him. The call is clear. The question is, what is the choice you will make? And I, I close with this point number three. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. That being a disciple, it is more than a confession, but it is a commitment to follow. Jesus calls all of us to be his disciples. And being a disciple is a choice we have to make. And upon making that choice, we must understand and realize that it is more than a confession, but it's a commitment to follow. You ever heard that phrase before? Talk is cheap. I don't think they got it from the Bible, but it could be validated in scripture in that much of what the Bible says is that, no, talk, talk is cheap. More than just a confession, being a disciple, it is a commitment to follow him. Well, hold on, Brandon. I thought, I thought I was taught and I was told all I got to do to be saved is just like raise my hand and pray the prayer. Isn't that what Romans 10, 9 through 10 says? I'll, I'll read it to you. That if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into or unto salvation. What, what do you mean that it's more than a confession? I thought confession was the whole thing. I prayed the prayer. I, I confessed with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord. Well, I, I will say this, that confession, that it is the starting point, or maybe we could put it this way, it is the doorway into being a disciple and life in Christ. But, but here's what we, we gotta remember. Let's circle back to this, Romans 10, 9. I'll read it to you again. 
we got to circle back and remember what it is we're confessing. It says that if you would confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus. And we've talked about this before, but in, in ca case, case you don't remember, I'll just remind you, what does the word Lord mean? The word Lord means ruler. The, the word Lord means boss. The word, the word Lord means master. The Bible doesn't say that if you would just confess with your mouth, I believe. It doesn't say if you would just confess with your mouth, you're real. But if you would confess with your mouth, you're Lord. Oh, 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 I believe. And you are real. But you are Lord. I, I bow my knee to you, King Jesus. For yes, I believe. And yes, I acknowledge your reality, the, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, but I confess you as Lord. So the Bible says that salvation comes, that, 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 that life in Christ comes and starts when we confess him as the Lord of our life. And here's what James 2.17 says. James 2.17 says, may I remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that we have to prove our faith, but rather it means that our faith is proved in action. Let me just elaborate for, 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 for a moment. It doesn't mean that you gotta prove your faith. Oh, oh, you believe in Jesus, huh? Prove it. Has anybody ever done this to you before? My, my kids uh, just started doing this to me. Oh, oh, really? Prove it. I don't got to prove nothing to no one. But pr prove it. No, it, it. This first doesn't mean that we got to prove our faith. All right, you say you're a Christian. Now prove it through perfection. It's not what it means. But what it means is that our faith, while we do not have to prove it, it is proven in action. Like, silly example, but if someone came to you and said, hey, tomorrow, I want to give you a check for a billion dollars. Just meet me at the church. I'm going to be there with the check. Your name's on it. A billion dollars. Oh, man, thank you so much. The proof of whether or not you really believed that is if you showed up. If you didn't show up, you, you are proving or your lack of belief is proved in the fact that you didn't show up. See, our faith does not have to be proven like we're earning or deserving, but rather our faith is proven through our, through our life. And what you gotta know is that being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus, that it is more than just a confession. It's more than just saying, all right, yep, I want to follow you. I believe I'm in. It's more than a confession. But rather, it is a commitment to follow. It's a commitment to follow him. I want to read you one last scripture. Um, I want to go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23 through 26. I want to read this to you. This is still the story of the rich young ruler. This is the story of the rich young ruler who Jesus invited to follow him. And he said, I, I, just, I just can't do it. It's too hard. He, he walked away. Jesus says this, then Jesus said to his disciples, surely I say to you that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished saying, who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said this, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Brandon, why is it so hard to make that commitment to follow? Why do I in so many ways feel like the rich young ruler? Why do I in so many ways feel and I can empathize with that young man who in his heart knew that he needed Jesus, knew something was incomplete and yet given the opportunity to leave 
his life and be a disciple couldn't do it. Why is it that I empathize with him? I'll tell you why. It's because Jesus said it's hard. Jesus said it is hard for someone who feels like they have a lot to lose to say yes to following him. You know, because that is the reality, isn't it? That being a disciple, it is a choice to leave our self-led, self-dependent lives. It's really what it is. It's, it's a choice to say, no longer will I be self-led, but I will now be led by Christ. No longer will I be led by self, my desires, my ambition, what I want, what I know. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my self-led life and I'm choosing to follow Christ it's, it's a Christ-led life now. I'm an apprentice of Jesus. I'm, I've given my life to be with Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to watch and listen and practice his ways that I might become like him. It is a, it is a departure from a self-led life and a departure from a self-dependent life. No longer am I depending on self. No longer am I putting all the eggs in the basket of I got to make it happen for myself. No, no, I'm leaving a self-dependent life to live a life that is fully dependent upon him. And Jesus said, here's the deal. It's hard. When you feel like you have a lot to lose and you got a lot of confidence and trust in you and yourself and yourself, and it's hard. His, his disciples go, oh man, well, so like, who could be saved? Who, who can be saved then? So are you telling me like no one that has money and influence, like no one can be saved? And, and I love what Jesus said. I don't know if you caught it. He said, you know, with man, this is impossible. But with God, oh, one of my favorite phrases in the scripture, but with God, but with God, all things are possible. Can I just say today to anyone who can empathize with the rich young ruler and says, okay, I, no, I, I see it, I, I get it. Jesus has called me to be more than just a believer in him, to do more than sit in a pew on Sunday mornings, try to have good morals and good values and acknowledge his reality, but he's called me to leave my self-led, self-dependent life and to follow him. No, I, 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 I get it, pastor. Jesus has called me to be a disciple. And I, I, I get it. It's a choice I have to make. And it's more than a confession, but it's a commitment to follow. No, I, I get it. I just don't know if I can do it. Can I encourage you? The Bible says you cannot do it in and of your own strength and ability, but it is a supernatural work that happens within us that it starts by yielding our life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I confess that you are the Lord and I wanna follow you. I am choosing today to follow you and to be your disciple, but I need you to help me. I need you to empower me. I need you to fill me with your spirit and enable me through your spirit and through your grace to follow you as your Disciple, We can't do this in our own efforts and in our own abilities. No, we need his help. We need his help. And can I just say this lastly, that it is, it's worth it. Here's what the Bible says, Matthew, last scripture that we'll read today. Matthew chapter 16, I believe it is. Matthew chapter, chapter 16, verse 26. Jesus says, what, what profit is it to a man? if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus says, what, what does it really profit if you get it all? What does it profit if you get everything that you want right now? Everything on your list, whether you've made the list or not, what does it profit if you get everything on your list? I made all the money. I climbed all the way to the top of the ladder. We have the house, we have the cars, we have the friends, we have the vacations, we have the status. I finally have it all. And yet the thing I no longer have is my soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
but he does it in exchange for his soul. Can, can I just say this morning, the point Jesus is making is that it, it's, it's not worth it. It is not worth it to live a self-led, self-dependent life, independent from Jesus, trying to make it happen for yourself. For even if you gain the whole world, like the rich young ruler, you will be left saying there's just something missing. Can I just encourage you, don't be the rich young ruler. Don't be this young man who says, oh, I know that I need Jesus. There's something missing. But at the invitation to follow him, I just, I can't do it. I guess I'm going to go back to my self-led, self-dependent life. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the, the, the life we really want, it's a life in Christ. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life to the full. There is no greater life. There is no greater sense of peace or joy or fulfillment. Oh, the life we really want, it's a life found in Christ as we follow him as his disciples. Can I pray for you this morning? God, I pray today for every single person under the sound of my voice, anyone sitting in either of our services, anyone watching online, anyone who listens to this podcast or the live stream. Lord, I pray for everyone who would hear this sermon today. And I pray that God, you would speak so clearly to them that in the same way those in the gospels heard Jesus say, come and follow me, that today in their spirit, they would hear your voice saying, come and follow me. Don't just believe in me. Don't just be one who acknowledges my existence, but come and follow me and be my disciple. And I pray today in the name of Jesus that you would help people by the power of your Holy Spirit to make that transition, to make that choice, to make the transition and the choice from being just a mere believer to being an apprentice of Jesus, to being a disciple of Jesus. And I pray that as you help us to make that choice, that more than a confession, we would give you a commitment to follow you and all we thank you in advance that as we follow you, King Jesus, that we shall become like you. For in the same way that you called those 12 young men, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That in the same way, as we come and follow you, you will make us like Christ. Mold and form and shape us into the image of Christ. We thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen.